Hi, I'm Simon K. Jones, and you're listening to the audio version of Tales from the Triverse. Read more at simonkjones.substack.com and listen to the audio version in your favourite podcast app. Shots Fired, Part 2 Previously, a group of Koth celebrating at a pub late one night is interrupted when a police bullet is fired at one of them, killing them instantly. London, 1974, November. The Koth's blood sprayed across the faces of their friends. The body slumped to the ground, quite dead, tail still twitching. The other two Koth were momentarily too startled to react, then the smaller one knelt down and cradled the head of the fallen. Constable Marie Pensthorpe jumped out of the police vehicle, drawing her weapon. Shit, what the hell did you do, Jones? Still aiming his smoking gun in the direction of the cough, Constable Max Jones tried to find the words, but found himself unable, his mouth opening and closing mutely. He felt his arm begin to shake, the one taking the weight of the weapon. The hand with the trigger finger. He'd fired a shot. Why had he fired a shot? He blinked then blinked again, trying to think, trying to get it straight in his head. The larger Koth, still standing, roared in anguish, spines extending along their arms as they dropped down into a threatening stance, like a dinosaur preparing to pounce. Why had he fired? Jones shook his head, then realised he was still pointing his weapon at the three Koth across the street, or two Koth, one of them was already dead. He lowered the weapon, he not meant to fire, had he? That's fucked up, Jones, said Constable Philip Scover, putting a hand on his shoulder and squeezing. A shot, though, right between the eyes. You know Koth have reinforced skull around the sides, but right between the eyes is a vulnerability. You got it right on target. Pop! Scower. He'd been whispering in Jones's ear, warning him about the Koth, telling him to watch out, how you can always tell when a Koth is about to attack by their posture, and especially if they start belching smoke or fire. That one across the street had done just that. It had clearly been a threat. All three of them had been advancing on the police vehicle's position. It's fine, Jones, Scarra said, patting him on the back. We'll go with self-defence. We can all corroborate. Right, Pensthorpe? She nodded. Nobody messes with the SDC. Yeah. Oh, shit. Scarra was suddenly all business, taking his own weapon from his shoulder and lifting it into position. Jones refocused just in time to see the pub door bang open, and an endless swarm of Koth pile out onto the street, all snarls and roars and cries of anger. There must have been at least twenty of them. He turned to Pensthorpe, who was aiming a camera instead of her gun. What are you doing? Documenting, she said, winking. Stand down, Scour shouted. There's no need for further bloodshed. Return inside, please. He adjusted his weapon, and Jones could see he was aiming it at one of the younger Koth. Get your gun up, Jones. Scarra hissed at him. You want to be torn apart? The noises from the crowd were terrifying. Not like a human mob, which could be intimidating enough as it was, but closer to a pack of animals, apex predators gathering for the kill. Jones realised in that moment that for all his training and arsenal, there was nothing he could do against several angry Koth. He wanted to go back to unload his weapon to take the bullet out before he'd fired it. Why had he pulled the trigger? It'd been an accident. No, not that. Not an accident. Self-defence. That was it. Not an accident. That makes him sound incompetent, like it was his fault. It needed to be the Koth's fault. Everyone knew how dangerous they were, especially after the attack earlier in the year on the restaurants. That's when Jones had killed his first Koth. He'd been held a hero. He'd saved his squad and all the nearby civilians. He'd even saved that other Koth, whatever his name was, who'd been involved in the fight. Why couldn't this be just like that? He heard Scourer calling for backup over the vehicle's radio. It wouldn't arrive in time. Quiet, all of you, came a shout, louder than all the others, cutting through the roaring and screaming. It was an older voice, the sound of a sword being forged. The cough fell to silence, though their anger was still evident. These police officers are not worth it, said the elder cough, moving to the front of the pack. They are animals. Leave them be. Do not waste your fire on them. We must look after our own. He crouched beside the dead cough and performed some sort of gesture that Jones couldn't catch. Fuck, that was close, Pensthorpe said. Scour laughed. Who knew there were so many of the bastards in that pub? Jones felt his trigger finger twitch. 
the next day. Flashbulbs lit up the drab meeting room. DCI Miller had called the press conference early to get out ahead of the papers. This kind of thing could spiral quickly if it was left to fester. Thank you all for coming, he began. As you already know, late yesterday evening there was a tragic incident in London which resulted in an officer discharging their firearm. During the confrontation, a Koth was unfortunately shot. Our condolences to their family. He took a breath, made sure he was looking suitably saddened. Any incident of this nature is of course regrettable, and a full investigation will be carried out to better understand the circumstances. For some context, as I'm sure there will be questions, I would like to present some footage shot at the scene. He signalled to the technician, who fiddled with the television in the corner. Grainy video appeared on the screen, showing a roaring, shouting mob of cough outside the pub the previous night. Pensthorpe had captured a good angle. As you can see, the situation was extremely sensitive by the time the officers arrived. Despite efforts to calm those at the scene, the Koth at the scene discharged their fire breath towards the officers, prompting them to take defensive action. All of this footage and statements from the officers and civilians at the scene will of course be submitted for review. There was a chatter of excited voices from the journalists present. He could see all the usual faces, ranging from the annoying to the supportive. Miller pointed to one of them. Yes, Jonah. This is the latest in a string of violent incidents involving Koth. Are we looking at a growing problem within the Koth population? Miller frowned and clasped his hands before him. It is true that we've had several such incidents. The horrific killing of DC John Callahan two years ago. The attack on the West End earlier this year. The assault on an innocent schoolgirl a year ago. But I would emphasise that these are all isolated incidents. The Koth community makes many valid contributions to our society and the behaviour of a few bad actors shouldn't tarnish the rest. Emma Matthews put her hand up. Miller ignored her, but she tried calling out her question anyway. Detective Miller, the Yvette Field case involved a human assailant? Lakshi, the Koth that was initially accused, was released without charge. He pointed to another journalist, Trevor, who was usually on side, but without being too obvious about it. We're only a month away from the referendum on permanent portal suspension. Do you see these rising tensions as being related to that, or having an impact on it? Miller took a deep breath and leaned on the lectern. Trevor, nothing we do exists in a vacuum, but obviously the Met Police and the SDC remain politically neutral. We exercise the law, not individual opinions. Any rise in violence will be dealt with accordingly, swiftly, and in order to protect civilians in London and around the kingdom. Question, Emma piped up again. Do you include Koth in your definition of citizen? If there are no further serious questions, then we'll leave it there, Miller said. He gestured to the television, still paused on a frame of angry Koth faces. You can all make up your own minds, and the internal investigation will release its findings as soon as possible. Thank you all for coming. DC Yannick Clark sat at his desk in the basement of the Joint Council Tower, arms crossed, a grimace of displeasure on his face. The news broadcast finished showing the press conference and switched to the next segment, a piece on the practicalities, or lack thereof, of closing the portals. The press conference had been a farce. Miller was growing bolder, that was for sure. His answers were a barely coded call to arms to every nutter and asshole holding a grudge against portal immigrants. He glanced across the office to where Kaminsky and Chuck Cabalti were watching on another screen, equally aghast. He knew that Backer would be in his partitioned office also watching, also feeling the screw tightening. They had evidence they could use against Miller and those he was working with, all of those schemers and liars, but it was trapped on a data card that couldn't be read using shitty backwards mid-earth technology. And none of them were going to be getting to Max Earth any time soon. Clark had suggested sending it in the mail to Justin, but... There was no guarantee it would reach its destination. Odd to think that Justin, the AI itself, was floating in space, unaware of what had transpired with its remotely operated clone. That science fiction stuff made Clark's head hurt. And so they were stuck in a stalemate, everyone pretending that everything was fine, nobody actually doing anything, but all parties quite aware of the precariousness of the situation. Meanwhile, the city was going to hell in a handbasket. Golding was somewhere with his shooter squad, debriefing them and still trying to figure out what had happened at the pub the previous night. Scour, Jones and Penstorp had closed ranks. They shouldn't have been anywhere near that part of town. Golding seemed like an okay fellow and was probably furious about his elite team getting caught up in something so public. 
Clark already knew where this one was going. There would be riots in the street. If not that day, then the next, or the one after. Before the end of the week, for sure. What was it Styles had written in her last letter? Sometimes you find yourself in a situation where there are no good options. That seemed about right. She was a clever girl. No good options. Sooner or later, they were going to have to pick one of the bad ones. Thanks for listening. A new chapter goes out on the newsletter every Friday. Head over to simonkjones.substack.com to find behind-the-scenes notes on this chapter. You can also subscribe to the audio version in your favourite podcast app.